All right, I'm starting my talk. So, uh, hi everyone. Um, I've been wanting to do a retrospective on Pearl 7 for quite some time. Last year I was supposed to come to the conference and do this talk, but the United States government had different plans. Um, I had to submit an entire visa to get in, and then I, I texted Todd and reached out and said, Todd, I got the visa, we're good. And he's like, great, next time it's in Canada. So I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> he said, no, 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 it's good, start working on your visa now. Okay. So I'll, I'll start by introducing myself. The only things that really matter is that previously I was the pumpkin for a few years, a few releases. These releases uh, I was in charge of, it was about roughly uh, six years of involvement on the releases themselves and as pumpkin, uh, probably a bit more, maybe a bit less. I was uh, in the Pearl Steering Committee once it was formed and I was behind Pearl 7. So, <clears throat> very quickly, does anyone know enough about Pearl 7 to give like a very quick summary or introduction of what it was? Okay, great, sorry, I'm not gonna give you a microphone. I was wondering <laughs> because I wanted to tell you that if you do, then this talk is probably not gonna be very interesting for you. Uh, for the rest, this talk is probably not gonna be very interesting <laughs> for you either. Okay, so what we will cover here is the idea behind Pearl 7, the, the thoughts that came behind it, the process around it, the mistakes that I made, there were quite a few, I'm gonna cover just a smidge of it, um, and why I still think it was the right thing to do, even though it did not work. So we're gonna start with the timeline. It's gonna be broad strokes because going through this timeline would take me far too long to organize and um, I, like I didn't want to. It's just, it's really long. There are, I have threads from like one day of discussion that were so long that it takes me like two weeks to read and it was like one day. So I'm definitely not going over all the timeline. Too many things happened. We did it for like, I think two years. So it was, it was quite a lot. So broad strokes. <clears throat> First thing, when I became Pumpkin, I started organizing the core summits. This was not necessarily a thing that Pumpkins do, but it was something that I wanted to do. Not only because I was very selfish and wanted to meet the people who work on core, because I really like them, but also because we actually use those summits to do a lot of really cool stuff. The majority of what we did were actually discussions, but we cut down things that would have taken maybe a few years on the list, we cut it down to like one day. It was absolutely amazing. One example of this is that the Pearl has a lot of things that were deprecated, officially deprecated. It's not uh, supported, but they were still in the language for over 20 years. So we had one session that took, I think, was it an entire day? Uh, that Abigail organized in which we actually pinned down a version in which each one of those things is guaranteed to be removed. And that was a massive thing that wasn't done in over 20 years. So that was really big. A lot of the things that we talked about were technical debt. I know that this one time I said that Pearl has technical debt and like three people attacked me out of nowhere to provide all of the evidence for, but really it, it does. Every language has technical debt. Every company has technical debt, every building has its technical debt. Like it's just, it's there. So we used to talk a lot about that. We also talked a lot about barriers. Barriers is not the term that we use, it's a term that I use now because I wanna separate that from other types of technical debt because technical debt is very vague and it could refer to a lot of different things and some of them you live with. So what do I mean by barriers? I'm going to provide two examples and then explain what they really mean to me. So for the first example, let's take this piece of code. You wrote this piece of code, I'm putting it on a one-liner, so obviously you can probably tell what's wrong with this, but let's assume that this is in a big pile of code. And the same mistake that you see here exists in that big pile of code. The error that we get is can't call method transformer without a package or object reference. I imagine quite a few here know already what that problem is, but assume for a moment that you're not an expert with years and years of Perl. Assume you're new. Or maybe you've done it not at the scale that people here have done it. You don't understand what this means because you're not touching packages and you're not touching objects. So you might feel like, oh, you know what, the parameters, okay, I'll, I'll fix, I'll add parentheses. No problem, maybe it doesn't, it gets confused between the first parameter and the second parameter, maybe it's thinking that this is for something else. You know what, I'll fix it, I'm gonna add braces. Uh, uh, parentheses. So you add parentheses and now you have parentheses and it's complaining about an array. Okay, I do have an array, it's near the input. Right, two parameters, so one, two, they should have a comma between them, right? Sure. Yeah, right, sure, okay, good. So we put a comma. 
Good, so far good. But here's the thing, if we're gonna use concise, be concise is a core module that helps tell you what are the different ops that Perl understood from it. So when Perl read this code, it created a set of ops. It created this tree similar to an AST, an abstract syntax tree. And this tree tells it what it should do. And concise, if you run it through dash M, dash uppercase M turns on a module, uppercase O allows you to turn on the B modules, which are internal, and then we're using B internal, uh, B concise, so that's gonna be concise there. And it will output into the terminal instead of uh, running it, it will just output all of the ops. This is what this looks like. Um, it's actually not that long, but it is quite confusing if you're not familiar with it. We are looking for this line, and we are specifically looking for this word, a non-hash. So Perl is saying, I understood that you have a hash reference there. Now we're seeing that this is a function. We want it to be a function, do things with an element. We're feeding it multiple elements. Nope, it thinks that it's a hash, an anonymous one. So obviously, we can use deparse now. And deparse does something different. Deparse tells you in Perl what Perl understood. Essentially, it outputs kind of like these ops and then generates code from that, sort of, simplified. Perl says, this is what I understood. And this is why you got those ops. What it sees here is that you have a do, which turns the do thing call into a single statement. And then whatever that will return, it will use as an invocant for a method call to transformer, and then transformer will receive input. That's very confusing. That's very confusing because we did none of that in our code. That was not our intention at all in the code that we had. What actually happened is that, as you probably guessed by now, we just forgot to load the module. Because we didn't load the module, we didn't load the prototypes of the module, of the, of the function definitions from this module that told us that there's gonna be a callback, and then there's gonna be an array, and that allows us to remove the word sub, and yada, 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 yada. But the fact that we forgot to do this was not the mistake that it gave us. The mistake that it told us about was what it tried to do from what it understood once we forgot to do this, right? There are several steps that happened. So a person looks at this and says, I had this situation, I, I don't know what's going on. The interpreter said, you did A, I understood B because of mistake C, then I tried to do B and got an error D. It's fairly remote from you. It's in a distance. And if we load it and now we try it with the parse, it will tell us, yeah, I get it, you have a subroutine there. No problem, understood. So we could do it by either writing it with the sub and everything, or you know, we load the transformer. Now, the interesting thing about the first example is that because in this case, Perl knows what you meant, if you don't have transformer defined, it will say, hey, I can't read this thing, because like, you don't have it, which is quite clear, I understand it. You don't have the function transformer. And then it could go, ah, oh, right. I need to load transformer. So let's take another example. It's a shorter one. This is a call to a hash, and you can give hashes more than one key. It's something that I absolutely love about Perl. You can say, I want to get more than one thing about hashes. And Raku has it for sure, if anyone's wondering, the, because whatever you're seeing, Raku will have it and better. But I mean, yeah. But, the idea is that you don't have to take out one key at a time. You can take out multiple keys and say, I'm going to assign, just give me a chunk of them. I'm going to assign them. I'm going to do whatever I want with them. It's a really awesome feature, except can anyone spot the error? I know it's a bit uh, further away from you. Dave, you don't count. Sorry. No, I love you, but you don't count for this. Yeah. It is the wrong sigil. It is the wrong sigil. Correct. So what we're doing is that we're accessing it with a dollar. And the dollar in Perl says, I want to have one item instead of an at. So this was a bug. We made a mistake. What Perl is going to do if we use dparse on it is it's going to do this other thing. It's going to take one of its special variables, the dollar semicolon, and it's going to use that in order to join all of those keys together. Then it's going to go there using that key, and then it's going to return whatever is in there. It's going to go there as a single item, and it will turn whatever is in there into an array. So we have some side effect that is really bizarre. Now. It is a really useful, <laughs> as Abigail pointed out, it is a very useful feature. The point is, though, that because we had one sigil of a mistake, 
we triggered a different piece of code. We triggered different syntax. And this is also kind of a weird thing to do. Obviously, I, I want to get multiple items because I have at foo, it's an array. But I'm asking for one item. So clearly, you can visually see that there's a mistake here. The person was talking about multiple items in the beginning, but they accident accidentally asked for um, one item from the hash, even though they gave multiple keys to the hash. So it's definitely not working out. The thing, um, if we were to use an at, it would just look like this, and then that, that obviously works. So the thing with these things, and the reason I call them barriers, is because these are things that we don't intend to happen. They are causing a chain reaction of other things that are happening that in many cases we do not know about. The example that we saw before, that's the multidimensional hashes. They're, they are a Perl 4 relic. They are useful, but they came from Perl 4 and there are different ways to do it. And for most people, they're not even aware of it because it's not, it's not a commonly used feature. So barriers are essentially this technical debt that we carry with us just like we have to turn on strict, like we have to turn on warnings, like we have to disable multidimensional arrays, like we have to disable indirect object notation. All of these are different things. They're, they're, they're technical debt that we carry with us. They have, in my opinion, three important properties. The first one is that it is knowledge many people do not have. Okay? How many people can say that they genuinely did not fully understand the first two the examples before they saw it? All right, if I have Carl's hand up, I think we're good. Um, for those who don't know, Carl is one of the uh, core devs and, and one of the regex uh, geniuses, and Unicode geniuses, sorry. So um, a lot of people don't have it. You're at this conference, you've been doing this for many years, not everyone is you. The next thing is that it is also very hard to acquire. This takes time. When I started with Perl, people told me, you should work with the community. And I, if I could draw how well I learned Perl, it might have looked like this, but once I played with the community and I, I met people, it shot up. A lot of people don't get to do that. They work at a company or they work by themselves and they're not aware of all of you. They don't talk to you every day. They don't read your code every day. They're not on CPAN. So the thing that took us years and a lot of relationships to learn, that's not easy. So it's hard information to acquire, not a lot of people have it, and probably the most important is that it doesn't add anything to the skill and to the capability of the developer and to their program. It did not add anything at all. Knowing about multidimensional arrays does not mean you will use them, because whatever they provide, you knew how to use it before. We all know to take tuples, create one string from it, and use it. So it's not that this is a new skill and you're like, oh my god, upgrade. I can now do things that I've never been able to do before. No. What you know is, I now know to avoid this. <laughs> you are probably not using indirect object notation. So you've learned that what Perl understands, unless you miss a parsing rule, that it will then do a different parsing that triggers a different feature, that then will get another error that, that might not be in the right place where you had the error. You learned all of this. It's not like you upgraded. You just know to avoid it. So it's very important to understand. It doesn't add anything. Take, for example, something different. Let's say that um, we have a very specific way of doing um, asynchronous programming or parallelism, concurrency, whatever. And you learn that way. That is a new skill. That is a new piece of knowledge. You might be able to transfer it to a new th another language. You will definitely now be able to use it. These are things that you now have upgraded with. Barriers are things you did not upgrade with. You are just trying to cross over because they are in your way. So we talked a lot about barriers. Now I'm going back to the talk, because until now, complaining. Okay. And we started thinking of how do we facilitate eliminating um, these barriers? Sorry. Yeah. Got it, okay. So how do we facilitate eliminating these barriers? We had a lot of ideas. These aren't the only ideas, but we definitely had a lot of ideas. We talked about having a keyword that you have for the entire file. So if you put that keyword in the file, we know that this is modern, and now we can maybe avoid some of these mistakes. We thought about having a keyword for a block. Corinna, over there, um, as you probably remember, we talked about Corinna as maybe the way to make that happen. Because then we could say, oh, like this is a Corinna object, this is its own scope, maybe we could do some stuff with it. We talked about having a different binary. Someone suggesting having a different interpreter binary other than P-E-R-L. 
We talked about having different interpreter flags. We talked about having file extensions. We talked about having um, arguments on the command line in the uh, environment variables. We had a lot of these ideas. And someone suggested at some point versioning. Now, I'm not gonna mention the person's name because I'm sure they will experience some abuse over it. But this was a really interesting idea. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized this is actually not a bad idea at all. Big version, big change. Small version or minor, compatible, that's it. Simple, people understand it, people look for it. When we started working on Perl 7, a lot of people reached out and said, oh, you're, you're producing a new version. And they were like, we've been producing new versions for years. But they didn't think about it. They were like, you're in five. You're not producing new versions. We're like, no, we have you know, 24, 26, 28. And they're like, no, these are all minors. We didn't even know they existed because they look at five. And we even said five all the time because we had six. And six didn't work, but now six is not a number we're gonna use, so we're still with five. And because of that, I do believe, and you know, not everyone's gonna agree with me, and that's totally fine. I've learned to like accept it. Um, but I do believe that that is also one of the reasons that we have this expectation of ourselves to not break it. It is five, it needs to be compatible with five. And when 5.8 or 5.10 came out, that was our level, that is the syntax. Between two and three, there were changes. Between three and four, there were changes. Between four and five, there were changes. But in five, we kind of hit this plateau. We make small changes. They're relatively small when you think of the things that were added between those versions. And I think that's one of the reasons. So okay, this is now an interesting idea. Now we're gonna take six, so this would just seem like we're trolling Rocket, which is not fair, not the intent. So I guess the next one would be seven. That's how we got there. Okay. So what we did next was said, okay, you know what, let's start gathering the barriers that we want to lower. We made a long list, and the list was basically composed of the core developers complaining about things that they do, people who are experts in the language, they do in order to have a good standard minimum to work with. The idea was, at the beginning, zero feature changes. We're just gonna lower barriers, that's it. That's all we want to do. What do we need in order to get there? This is where we mistake number one happened. One of the core developers quit. They had objections, they were worried. We talked about it, but I genuinely do not think that this person received all the time that they deserve to air their disagreements, their arguments, and to review them thoroughly. Now, given more time, we might have reached the same decision. Person might have decided, you know what, I'm still, I'm still good, this is not me, which is fair but we would have reached it at a much better place. We might also have realized from those discussions that this just shouldn't happen, which, you know what, nowadays I think we'd also be okay. But what I do know is, is that this person left and while they're not holding it against me, I still feel very guilty for it. And that's the first big mistake, I still think about it. Going back to our timeline, we had the changes we wanted. What we wanted was to reduce barriers. We had this really nice list. And we, now we had the mechanism. The mechanism was versioning. We're gonna have versions. Next thing, backwards compatibility, because you know, Perl. So we came up with a few options. These are not the only options we came up with, but they are some. <clears throat> we thought about progmas that upgrade and downgrade behavior. So if you are on seven, you can make it uh, work like five. You can make it work like eight to get the, a hint that the new features that you're gonna get. If you're on eight, you could downgrade to seven and you can act like seven or you could upgrade to nine and get a hint of all the features that will go production in nine. We thought about compatibility modes that would actually allow you to have a certain type of behavior in theory indefinitely, depending on how long the compatibility code would continue to work. We talked about static analyzers and semantic rewriters that would allow you to rewrite your code in order to do stuff like that. We talked about long-term support. This was a request by a distribution and we were really happy to provide it. We talked about having multiple installations using localization, uh, both localizing Perl and localizing CPAN. Someone came up with an amazing idea on how to make CPAN fully compatible to any version and how to allow um, patches by the community and how to allow um, all of these different things working. Um, unfortunately, that did not work out because they met objection that they, uh, they just couldn't deal with that anymore, and the project died. It's a shame, it was brilliant. We also had the nuclear option. <clears throat> nuclear option is basically, you want an old version, 
you can pin it, you can have it on RPM, Deb, whether your distribution provides it, whether a vendor provides it, uh, whether you use ProBrew, whether you just build it yourself. Distribution for what it's worth, we're actually on board with this. They said, uh, not with this, but with moving forward, they said, yeah, we can just patch all of our local stuff and people will get Perl that works. We're fine with it, that's not a problem. And the nuclear option in short was, if you really want to use an old Perl, the language, you use an old Perl, the interpreter. The counter argument to this is, is quite fair to say, I still would like the security patches that come in in new versions. But the counter point is essentially someone wanting all of us to use, um, the, wanting for the price of their um, security patches for all of us to have really old syntax. They wanted to basically say, my syntax is the barrier, is, is the plateau, and we're not moving past it, but I do demand more fixes to my security. So that's kind of a difficult argument to maintain. <clears throat> okay, then we started discussing with stakeholders. Stakeholders included distributions, a lot of it with Debian, who are amazing, and their Perl team is unbelievable, very professional, insightful, smart, and, and just good dudes. Then um, we talked to more core developers, and I even reached out to several pumpkins in the past and spoke to them about it. This, this basically, we extended the circle to more and more people. We got mixed responses. <clears throat> but, and you might not believe it, primarily supportive, which was really interesting. But then came mistake number two. We need to talk to even more people. There were quite a few smaller communities and people that had a stake that we did not consult. In fairness, what we were worried about is that it would grow too fast, too quickly, and wouldn't be able to manage it. But what happened in practice is that a lot of people should have been consulted and talked to, and they were offended, they were hurt, they were right. Then mistake number three. <clears throat> Use more communication channels. So um, this was the height of the pandemic, and I have not seen a lot of people. So we did everything by video. Remember, we Zoomed everywhere. So that's what we did. But there are a lot of people who don't use Zoom or any kind of video call or any kind of call or any kind of synchronous communication. And these are all different ways to communicate and it's fair. Um, if we don't do it, we're, there is a, a form of disrespect, but we're also not getting their opinion. So we're also losing a lot from it. And we focused primarily on having video calls. There are a lot of people that we didn't talk to and some people were really um, hurt that we didn't reach out because they had a different communication form. Okay, the next thing that we did was announce publicly. A lot of people were excited. A lot of people were excited. Some people were anxious. Very few were actually really unhappy. I can say that from the excitement, this we actually got a lot of attention outside the Pearl community. And it really emphasized the point because people produced articles saying, Pearl's getting a new version. And we're in this room, still know we're producing a new version every month, uh, every month for the dev and every year for a new big stable version. But the articles that came out were, yes, Perl is upgrading. It's getting finally a new version because they saw what I eventually saw when I thought about versioning enough. That version number is important. It signifies to us, it signifies to users, it signifies to distributions and vendors, and it signifies even to people who just write articles. It signifies to everyone. So, okay, these are kind of the responses that we got. And then all hell broke loose. So, <clears throat> this is when mistake four happened. A lot of people deserve to have conversations about it. They reached out, some of them were how do I put it lightly? Terrible. Um, but people did need attention and time to talk and go over things that they genuinely had issue with, whether it's implementation, whether it's information that was not clear, whether it's something we didn't mention, whether it's a general disagreement with this. And the mistake is that I did not give enough time to enough people. And to be completely honest, and I don't like having to say it, I did not treat everyone with the respect they deserve, which is not okay. I will say, however, the, everyone there is because I want to make an addendum to it. I think it is important that you give people attention, but I also think it's fair to define 
the people you're willing to continue interact with. Everyone wanted, everyone who wanted attention believed they deserved it. But I don't think they all genuinely deserved it. Because some people, what they wanted to air was just toxicity. And it's not actually conducive to moving forward in any way. So to say, you're an idiot, I mean, that's not going to go into the Pearl 7 proposal. <laughs> even if you're right. So I think that should have actually been something that I, I should have done. I should have basically said, well, here are the things that I'm really happy to talk about. But this kind of behavior, I, I'm sorry, I will not entertain. And then focus on people who have arguments, uh, ideas, thoughts. They all deserve attention. They deserve way more respect than I believe I gave them. <clears throat> all right, mistake five. Deal with the utter abuse <laughs> that I received better. Um, I'm not sure how. Um, what happened was that, I said this in a previous talk, uh, when you have any kind of public role, people assume that they deserve your time. They deserve your attention. They deserve your well-being. They do not care if you have a problem with one thing or another. They want it. And they also believe that they're able to talk to you however they want. And some of these things were really vicious. I was kind of going on burnout at that point. Which leads me to the next mistake. Don't burn out. If anyone here, <laughs> if anyone here is considering burning out, <laughs> at the risk of sounding too confident about knowing the answer, my suggestion is just don't. <laughs> like, not good, just don't do it. If you're thinking about it, don't do it. Not sure how. Okay. <clears throat> Going back to the timeline, we now talk with it. The next thing that happened is the pumpkin roll was replaced with a Pearl Steering Committee. So the Pearl Steering Committee, I joined it. It was an election, essentially. It was a very long process. We had to discuss the discussions, and we had to discuss how we will vote on to have it, and then we had to vote, and then we joined. It was a very, very long. To say the least, we had one email, um, an entire mailing list, just on talking about how to talk and how to vote. Like that was an, its own mailing list. So, okay, I joined PSC, I tried to uh, keep Pearl 7 going. But here's the thing. The Pearl Steering Committee, in my opinion, was not interested in Pearl 7. I respect the people that I worked with on it dearly, but I, I don't think they were interested. In it. But the, the worst thing, in my opinion, is that I don't think the Pearl Steering Committee wanted to deal with people who weren't interested in Pearl 7. Because while they were a few, and I won't go whether they had solid arguments, because they did, the way some of them behaved was very difficult. The Pearl Steering Committee has a previous pumpkin who quit. <laughs> so it is that difficult. The other person quit the steering committee as well. So these people have had public roles. They experienced the way that some people behave. And in my opinion, they decided they do not want to deal with it. And slowly what happened is that I'm going to just return to the topic at hand. Um, it was killed by a thousand cuts. We kept having conversations on how do we do this, but like without really doing it. Could we like enable strict, which everyone does nowadays, but can we do it, but like not enabling strict? And, and could we do like the warnings thing, but just like not do it and say that we did? And we had these very long discussions that were really tiring. And essentially, eventually, I was told, yeah, we're voting to, to uh, cut it off. So <clears throat> this is when um, I quit the Pearl Steering Committee. Because as much as I respect the people on it, and as I told them, which they graciously understood, is that I did not join this in order to not do anything. I joined it because I want things to happen. They could happen way better than I have done them. And that will always be true. But I wanted things to happen. OK, next mistake. There are people who disagree with what we did. And I know, I don't think, I know that the disagreement that I had with them caused me to mischaracterize the way they thought. If my position is, we need to have new developers joining Pro, and someone's position is, no, that sounds really weird. And that's kind of how I characterize their position. But that's not fair, because that's not the position. 
The position is more subtle and more nuanced than this. The position is, we don't think that could happen. If we don't think that could happen, then the thing we know does happen, which is maintenance, we want to make sure it won't break. I don't necessarily agree with it, but that is a really fair perspective. That's a fair position to have. And I mischaracterized that position, which is hurtful and unfair, and definitely doesn't lead to any productivity. So that was a big mistake. Oh, I have this one. Next. OK, so <clears throat> we need to start wrapping up, right? Um, this is a retrospective after all, so what have we learned? First, take more time. Take like way more time. Also talk to more people. Listening does not mean agreeing. I don't know how many times I've had to say this to people. The fact that I listened to you does not mean that I agree with you. The fact that I didn't agree with you does not mean that I didn't listen to you. I remember one conference we had. It was a big discussion, round table, and there was a proposal being discussed. People voted. People talked about it. And one person after this wrote a really kind of crappy post. It wasn't like really terrible, but it, was, it, it stung to everyone that was there, basically saying, no one is listening, no one cares, no one hears me out, you know. And me and another person, we have to respond with, yeah, we all heard you, we just disagreed. And you need to know the difference between the two. Like it's not, you can't just shout out to the world that we disregarded you because you didn't get your vote in. But there is an addendum to this. Um, and this is more for me, this is a mistake that I've made. Um, the fact that I disagree with someone does not necessarily mean that I heard them well and that I didn't mischaracterize what they meant to say. So the fact that I disagree, it sounds to me like I heard you. In some cases, I don't think that I did. Another thing is formalizing commitment. <clears throat> we had one person who, when we were working on this, was really in favor. Then it came out, and a few people were vocally against it, and he respected them, and then he responded with, yeah, it's not, it's not good. And then I reached out to him and I said, but we, we talked all about this and you were really in favor. And he said, oh yeah, I'm definitely in. And then the next day he wrote in a, 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 another thing that said, yeah, no, but, but I'm against. And what I realized is that every day he's been talking to different people. So every day he flipped and flopped. And it happened so often that we had like threads in which one message was, oh, this is, this is just horrible. The next one, but I'm in. But it won't work. But we can definitely do it. So it is important to formalize commitment. There were also people who they were in favor, but then when it came out, they stated their position publicly as against it. But when I reached out to them, I said, that's not exactly what I mean. What I mean is that there are certain things that I'm really, really worried about, and I haven't seen those resolved by us. And when we do resolve them, I am definitely in. But unless we resolve it, I can't, I'm not going to sign off on it. I'm not in, in favor. All right. Uh, use multiple communication forms. But not using the one that you like does not count as nothing at all. And that's something that I also received. I had uh, people yell at me because I didn't use the one very specific communication channel that they use, which I will not mention IRC. And, <laughs> and that's, like, that's not fair. That's not, I, I had conversations with people until 3 and 4 a.m. It was a lot. But it didn't count because it wasn't whatever their communication uh, format that they preferred, which I will not mention RC Um Additionally, take more time for disputes. Disagreeing is actually healthy. Disputes is actually healthy with people who are willing to do it respectfully. And I should have taken way more time, way more time. If it took two or three or four more years to get to a good point, that would have been way better, even if that point meant not doing it. Also, people feel entitled to treat you however they want. That was a very harsh lesson for me. I did not like learning this. Also, if it bothers you, it's your fault. Also, if you don't like it, you should be shamed for it. But more importantly, I learned that you will probably have to deal with it mostly alone. Last thing that I learned is you need to step away before you burn out. Again, at the risk of sounding confident, if you're thinking about it, don't burn out. But in all seriousness, if you feel like you might be, take steps back. Give yourself time to breathe. It is way more important. People will take care, take, take care of the rest. You take care of you. 
OK, right. But retrospectives are about the future, so let's talk about the future again. The question that we often ask ourselves and that people, other people ask us is, Pearl dead, we all ask it. Uh, whoever's given a presentation, it's very likely that you either had this on a slide or remove that slide. I've had a lot of uh, positions on this. I moved from definitely not to definitely yes. But I have to say that now my position is much more nuanced, having stepped away from it, and have stepped away in such a negative way for me. It depends. I think that for certain things, Pearl is definitely not dead. For other things, it might be. So for new projects, I would probably use it, but I don't know if everyone will or if everyone here will. For maintenance, probably not dead. It will probably continue for a fairly long time. Things don't die that easily. Will it be useful for porting away from it? So that's what some of us will have a job with? I'm certain. I know some of this exists now. How long it will be available? I'm not sure. So there are cases in which I would definitely say, yeah, Pearl's probably probably, likely, maybe, dead there. But definitely a few things that not even close. But again, sorry, we need to talk about the future. So this is kind of where I'm going to wrap up, because this is really where retrospective should end. <clears throat> I'm not in that future, probably. But even though I am probably not in that future, the thing that I really want to leave you with is that you are. Everyone here and people are watching this afterwards online. You're in that future. So it is something for you to decide on. PSC settles decisions. There are proposals that come in, they approve them, they make some other decisions. I think they still approve the grants. P5P, the core list, builds Perl, the interpreter. But you're the people who create Perl, the language, and the community. You have to decide where you want Perl to go. And maybe what you want it to do is to be a language for new things. I know some of you are interested in that. You want to build the next big thing with it, and you want it to be equipped to do it. Some of you are thinking, look, I, I just don't see it happening. But I am making money maintaining this thing, and I definitely don't want that to break. And that is also a very legitimate position to have. But this does need to be resolved, because Pearl is kind of on the fence on this. And it's kind of this quasi weird state where some things are modern-ish, some things are really not, and no one really decided. So I think the people in this room and the people online, you need to think about it, and you need to make a decision. Because honestly, it is up to you, not me. So, where will it go? You decide. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, we have some time for questions. Does anyone have any questions? No questions? None? Yes? Uh, comment, actually. I have a, excuse me, I have a question. I don't have a question. Would you like me to repeat this uh, for people who are on a, yeah. So Ovid, who worked on Corinna, which is uh, one of the most modern things we'll see in coming years in Perl, um, and in the last, I don't know how many years, um, 
expressed that you have experienced also abuse in the form of more than just profanities, uh, all the way to threats, and that it was very difficult. And even though it was resolved, you still carry it. And you're not going to join IRC anytime soon. But I don't know why you would mention IRC. I don't have any. <laughs> I don't, the relevancy to the, I just don't, yes. I have two comments. First off, I want to thank you for everything you did and try to do while you were coming here and everything else. My pleasure. Yes. Number two, as part of the pro community, I want to apologize on behalf of the Muslim community. You, I appreciate it, but you don't need to. You really don't. There are people who I know where they are, and there are people who, uh, when I doubted where they were because we were arguing uh, afterwards, I, I realized and that, that was great. So thank you. Um, any questions or any more comments? I don't. Um, yes, Jen. Well, since I was involved in the uh, attended actual Pro Seven implementation, but I wasn't really involved in a lot of the, the higher level. I sense at the time how uh, you really felt the need to have breakthrough in Pearl for Pearl to retain uh, any, any relevance. And the particular set of uh, functionalities that we attempted to uh, implement that would eventually come to Pearl 7, things like certified call, things like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So yeah, I, I, I think a lot of people don't know how much work was actually put in uh, in practice in code, not just in discussions. Uh, Jim specifically was involved in a ton of work to make Perl itself and all of its libraries use strict in a lot of places that included a ton of tests, that included a lot of code corrections, that included a lot of warnings and, and minor things being fixed or to smooth out. So I just wanna, I wanna call out and say thank you because you invested a massive amount of time and uh, we didn't get to talk too much during that because we each were in a different area of working on this, but might as well give your props to him, so thank you. Um, and we have one more? Sure. Any any other uh, comment, question, query? Um, to Carl. Well, now that you've trademarked, Pearl is dead. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's trademarked after uh, Stephen Little. Oh, now you could retire <laughs> on the proceeds. On the proceeds. <laughs> if only. That's, I think that's Stevens. I actually wanted to do like a, um, um, there's, there's a band called Crass from the UK in the late 70s. And uh, they, they said punk's dead. Uh, basically, it was already overwhelmed with uh, uh, financial uh, interests and something. And... Um, and uh, then another band came out with Punk's Not Dead, and it, like I thought maybe I could use that, but like no one would get the reference other than me, and maybe maybe Dave Cross, so uh, <laughs> and one Olaf at the back. So uh, consider this had been a really amazing meme that that you got to witness. All right, I think we're done. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of it. Enjoy the weekend. Godspeed. <laughs>